I'm delighted that you've made it your decision to be here tonight. I recognize on a Saturday night, sometimes people have other plans, and the fact that you've made it your decision to be here encourages me. And hopefully, by the time the lesson is through, you'll be encouraged as well. So I encourage you to get a Bible and turn and follow along with us as we study together. If you have questions about the lesson, I'll be glad to answer them when the lesson is over. We announced last evening that we'd be talking about tonight about sexually attractive dress. That title was carefully worded for this study to describe the problem that we want to address. And that is because that perhaps immodesty sends different messages to different people. That is the word immodesty. May send a different message to different people. And thus one whose dress is sexually attractive, whether she knows it or not, or he knows it or not, may think she is not immodest. And we run into that a great deal, wherein someone may be dressing in a sexually attractive way, and yet they do not realize that they're dressing that way. And so when you talk about being modest, they think they are modest. And you'll see why I say that as the lesson unfolds. Now let's start by looking at Proverbs chapter 7, if you will. And I want you to notice with me that it is altogether possible that one could dress so as to be sexually attractive. Proverbs 7 and verse 10, by the way, chapters 5, 6, and 7 are three chapters that go together that deal with the harlot. And in chapter 7 and in verse 10, there met, there, uh, and there was a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. Well, the attire of a harlot says a great deal, doesn't it? That she is trying to be attractive to someone for selling herself and so that tells me that it's possible to dress so as to be sexually attractive. The Living Bible paraphrase translated that, that she dressed seductively. And it is possible to dress in a seductive way. Now I want to suggest to you that being sexually attractive or attracted is not wrong within itself. In fact, Proverbs chapter 5, I won't take the time to turn and develop that passage, but you'll remember Proverbs 5, I said 6, 7, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 go together as a unit of chapters dealing with the, the harlot. But Proverbs 5 is that passage. It says, rather than a man going and fulfilling that relationship with a harlot, let him rejoice in the wife of his youth. And that's talking about the sexual relationship. And so being sexually attractive or attracted is not wrong within itself. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 and in verse 9, it is better to marry than to burn with desire. I say that because God made us that way. And so that's not wrong within itself. But I want you to understand that being sexually attractive or attracted to anyone other than your marriage partner is wrong. And that's what we want to talk about tonight as we talk about sexually attractive dress. I want to ask you to give this study a fair hearing. There are these kinds of studies that sometimes we get tired of dealing with the question and we get tired of seeing immodesty around us to the point that we think it just doesn't do any good to preach on the immodesty because people are going to do whatever they want to do. But I want to suggest to you that such studies probably do more good than we credit them. It would be much worse if we didn't preach on it. Do you think how bad it is when we preach on it constantly? And you think how bad it would be if we didn't preach on it, and there are churches where there's very little preaching done on the subject of immodesty, and it is much worse in those churches. So that probably does more good than we think. Not everybody present tonight will accept everything they hear tonight 100%. I understand that. And not everybody who will accept it 100% will conform to the principles. There will be many who may look at it and say, I agree fully with what you just said, but they may not live by those principles even though they agree. But I'm simply asking that you give it a fair and an honest hearing. And I'm simply asking that you listen to what is going to be presented in a plain and a blunt way and yet in a tactful way, I hope. But you're going to hear some things tonight that you'll say, you know what, I've heard that before. And then you may hear some things tonight that you may say, you know, I didn't know that and I, that's never been explained to me. That, that particular point never has been driven home to me before. And all I'm asking you tonight is to give this study a fair hearing. We must admit that a great portion of the clothing that is worn today in the world is sexually attractive. And by that I'm talking about kinds of clothing and this is just a sampling, a small sampling of what we're talking about. Now I'm talking about in the world, I'm not talking about among us, and there is that kind of dress and attire among Christians at times, but let's begin with the principle in the world. 
And by that I simply mean there are the low-cut tops, there are the short shorts, there's the tight jeans, the form-fitting outfits, there's the short skirts, there are the splits in the dresses, and there's wording across the backside of a pair of jeans or some kind of garment. So it draws attention to a certain part of the body. And all of that is designed to draw attention to the female body. And we have to admit that there is such a thing as sexually attractive dress. Let's go back a number of years and get this quotation from Mary Quant. Perhaps you've heard this before. She was the designer of the miniskirt, and she said the mini clothes, that's M-I-N-I -I, clothes, were symbolic of those women who want to seduce a man. Now, that's not your grandmother saying that. That's not an old fogey preacher saying that. That was the designer of the miniskirt. And when asked, where is all of this headed? She said in one word, say. I want you to notice the date on this one, 1956. That was before I was born. That was before somebody as old as Paul was born. That's a long time ago. And here's what they said in 1956 in Life magazine. They reported that short shorts were favored to Bermuda shorts. Why? Because Bermuda shorts emphasized the least attractive part of the legs, the knee and the calf. What all of that says is that it's possible that there is such a thing as sexually attractive dress. That's what we're talking about. And our culture thinks that's good. Do you remember what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5 and in verse 20? Isaiah condemned those who would call good evil and evil good. We live in a time when our culture takes things that are evil and they call it good. They take abortion and they say that's a good thing. They take something good like capital punishment they say that's evil. They've got it all reversed. Well, you remember Philippians 3 and in verse 19, Paul talks about how their glory is their shame. What they ought to be ashamed of is what they glory in. And what they ought to be glorying in, they're ashamed of. Their glory is their shame, he said. And so our culture says that's good. When there are women who are dressing in these outfits that we have presented here before you at the top of the screen, there would be those who, when they see a woman dressed like that, they will commend her saying, you look darling in that. You look absolutely astonishing in that. You look great. They call evil good. We would be absolutely naive to think that our culture does not rub off on us. If we think we live in some kind of isolation where our culture doesn't impact us, we have our heads buried in the sand because that's rubbing off on us. Where our culture says that's good and we are impacted by that as well. Here's the first point we want to consider. I want to talk a little while about simple principles for dress. Let's look at some simple Bible principles that have to do with how we dress and how it governs our dress and then we'll come back to some application of that. Let's start with Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 2 will start in fact in verse 25 in just a moment. But I want to talk about divinely made clothing. That's what I call this in Genesis chapter 3, divinely made clothing. We live in a society where there's a great emphasis given to who made the clothes, the designer thereof. When you see the celebrities on television and a woman comes across the screen in this long dress, there's a great emphasis, she is wearing A, and then they'll cite the name of the designer. Not that she's wearing this fine dress, but she's wearing a Oscar de la Rente, whatever it may be. And so here is the designer. The emphasis is given on the designer. Well, nothing wrong with that, but I think we need to give emphasis to the designer. On this occasion in Genesis 3, let's talk about divinely made clothing. God made some clothes one time, and let's see what he made. But let's back up before God made that. In Genesis chapter 2, if you will, and in verse 25, God had made Adam and Eve. In verse 25, if you're so disposed to make notes in the margin of your Bible, you might get a pencil and mark as we begin to note some of the words that are used here. Look at verse 25. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That word naked means they were nude. You say, how do you know? There hasn't been a stitch of clothes put on them yet. We don't have that to chapter 3. So God made the man and the woman, and the text says they were naked. That means they were nude. That's how the Bible uses that term in that verse. But let's go a little bit later, and we notice in verse 7 that the text says the eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked. You might underline that. That still means they were nude. They don't have a stitch of clothes on at all. And the Bible says that was naked. We understand that. That same verse, verse 7 says, they sewed together fig leaves and made for themselves coverings. And so they made themselves a covering that covered the midsection of the body. Now how do I know that? 
Well, the word that is used here has reference to a girdle-like or loincloth type of garment, according to these authorities, Kyle and Dalich from Pulpit and Blue Pole and, and the Hebrew lexicons. They suggest that the word simply means a loincloth, something much like we would have that covers the midsection of the body, like something similar to jogging shorts. I don't mean they made jogging shorts, but something that covered that section of the body. And I want you to notice now at verse 10 that following that, that he said, I heard the voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The same term is used. This time they're not nude though. But they are naked in a relative sense. That is, the Bible still describes them as being naked even though they covered a portion of their body. Let's jump a little further in chapter 3 and then I want you to notice in verse 21, now God comes on the scene and God makes for them clothing, as we just talked about a minute ago. And when God clothed them, I want you to notice what verse 21 says. That for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. They were not clothed prior to that. Now, they had some clothing on, but it wasn't proper. So what I want you to notice at verse 21, they were naked at verse 7. They were still naked after they partially covered themselves. But God made them a tunic of skin that covered from the shoulder to the knee because that's what a tunic was. Let's get some evidence of that. In the original ISB article on dress, it says that this word that is translated the covering of verse 7 resembled the Roman tunic, corresponding most nearly to the long shirt, reaching below the knee always, and in the case designed for dress occasion, reaching almost to the ground. Later in the same article, it was noted that this had reference to an outfit that was worn by peasantry, was shorter like the modern camis of Syrian fellow, which is to the knee. What I learned from that, that the tunic went from the shoulder to the knee. Let's get a little more evidence of that. And Brown Reverend Briggs suggested that this word simply means a tunic, generally with sleeves coming down to the knees and rarely to the ankles, but always to the knee. Let's go a little bit further. Fred Wright in Manners and Customs of Bible Land, Wright says the tunic in appropriately translated coat was a, was a shirt that was worn next to the skin. It was made of leather, hair-like uh, cloth, wool, linen, or modern times, usually of cotton. The simplest form of it was without sleeves and reached to the knees, or sometimes to the ankles. The well-to-do wore it with sleeves and extended to the ankles. Women as well as men wore it, although there was no doubt a difference in the style and the pattern worn by the two. Well, we could go on compounding that kind of evidence, and what I just learned from that is that when God put clothing on the man and the woman, he put clothing that went from the shoulder to the knee. That was divinely made clothing. I want you to notice three things that I just learned from that context. What I learned from that, number one, is that man's attempt to clothe himself, as brief as it was, was insufficient. Man clothes the middle section of the body, and God says that's insufficient. He had to make more clothes for them. Number two, I learned from that context, that when God made the clothes, it went from the shoulder to the knee. Thirdly, I notice, and listen to this carefully, God put clothes on the man just like he did the woman. Much of our preaching targets the women and say they need to dress modest and let the men pretty much do whatever they want to do. But when God put clothes on them, he put the clothes on the man just like he did the woman. He thought they both needed to be attired properly and to be modest. And that's what I learned from the divinely made clothing. Here's another principle. I want to talk about nakedness. That's a Bible subject. We don't generally, in a, in a mixed setting, want to talk about nakedness, but that's a Bible subject, and we need to talk about how the Bible uses that. Nakedness is not to be seen except by one's mate. I want us to go back for a moment to Leviticus 18 for a second, and I want us to notice that in the Old Testament, and in just learning a principle here, I know we don't live under the laws of the Old Testament, but we learned some principles. It was written for our learning. Romans chapter 15, but in Leviticus 18, in the Old Testament, uncovering the nakedness of anyone other than their mate was prohibited. Look at verse 8, or verse 6, I'm sorry, Leviticus 18, verse 6. None of you shall approach anyone who is near kin of him to uncover his nakedness, I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father, the nakedness of your mother, you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Well, what I'm learning from that is that to discover one's nakedness was prohibited, it was forbidden. And what that implies is that the normal state of things is for nakedness to be covered. 
The Bible repeatedly says that showing one's nakedness is equated with shame. We saw that in Genesis 3 and in verse 7. Because when they suddenly realized we are naked, they attempted to clothe themselves. As poor a job as they did, they attempted to do that because it's equated with shame. Well, let's turn over to the book of Revelation, if you will, chapter 16. I have three references before you. Chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 16 and 15 and 17 and in verse 16. But I will look at the 16th chapter in verse 15 that all through the Bible, I showed in Genesis 3, and I'm showing you now at the end of the Bible in, in Revelation, that nakedness and shame are equated one with the other. Revelation 16 and in verse 15, Behold, I am uh, coming as a thief. Blessed is the one who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. To expose your nakedness is to expose shame. That's shameful to do that. The Bible equates those two principles. Now, how is the word nakedness used in the Bible? Well, Thayer says that the word has, uh, and we'll give a quotation from Thayer in just a second, it can have reference to complete nudity, but that same word can have reference to partial nudity. Let's get a quotation from Thayer, lexicographer. He says that the word translated nakedness simply means unclad or without clothing. Nude, as we saw in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 25. But it can be used in this sense also of ill-clad or clad in undergarment only. Have some garments on, but still said to be naked. Give me further evidence of that. Kettle says it's badly clad or not fully clad. Liddell and Scott says lightly clad, and Kubo says that much the same thing. Here's the point that I learned from that, and that is that one can have on some clothing and at the same time still be said to be naked. For example, if you were to walk up to someone who was wearing a bikini and you told her, you are naked, you need to go home and put clothes on. She probably would be offended because she's thinking, I'm not naked at all. That's a Bible term, and the Bible uses it in that sense. Let's go further about this pr principle of nakedness. Here's something I want you to think about, that exposing the thigh, exposing the thigh is exposing one's nakedness. Let's give some biblical evidence of that. Exposing one's thigh is equated with showing your nakedness. You say, how do you know? Well, let's look at some Bible passages. Let's start back in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, well, I'm just going to make quick reference because we've already read Genesis 3 and in verse 7, that when they realized they were naked, that is, they were nude, shameful, they covered the midsection of the body. That did not fully cover. And they were still said to be naked. They're the showing parts of their thigh, to say the least, as well as other parts of their body, and they were naked, the text says. But that's perhaps not the strongest proof that we can give, so let's go a little bit further. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 28. In Exodus, chapter 28, this is to reference to the garments for the priest. And I know we're not wearing the garments of the priest, but it defines for me, because the thigh hasn't changed, <laughs> we have thighs just like we had then, that hasn't changed at all, and so God defines what he means by making this here. I want you to notice in verse 42, Exodus 28, 42. You shall make linen trousers to cover their, here's our word, nakedness. The high priest is to have a garment that covers his nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thigh. That expression, from unto, encompasses and includes that which is mentioned. It's used a number of times through the, uh, that kind of uh, Hebrew idiom is found throughout the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis 11, Exodus 11, and a host of other passages that we could talk about at another time. But it includes that which is talked about or which is mentioned. From the thigh or from the waist unto the thigh. What are they covering when they cover from the waist to the thigh? That is, they cover the thigh, they're covering their nakedness. So when you expose your thigh, you're exposing your nakedness. More about that in application in a second. So notice another passage in the Old Testament. So what I just saw in Exodus 28 harmonizes with Genesis chapter 3. Isaiah 47 is going to do the same thing, showing that we've not misunderstood those passages, but that's exactly how God intended the thigh to be understood. Notice at verse 2 of Exodus, this is not talking about one's literal thigh, but he is talking about what he's going to do to Judah. And notice at verse 2, take the millstone and grind the mill, remove your veil, take off your skirt. Are you reading with me now? Uncover your thigh. 
pass through the rivers, your nakedness shall be uncovered. When the skirt is raised and the fire is exposed, your nakedness is seen. You think about that now. And when that's the case, I want to tell you that when one sees your thigh, they're seeing your nakedness. That may come in the form of a bathing suit, and you're showing your thigh. They're seeing your nakedness. That may come in the form of shorts, where a portion of the thigh is exposed, you're showing your nakedness. Or maybe it's the short dress. Or maybe it's the dress that's long enough while you're standing, but when you sit down, part of the thigh is exposed, and those around you are seeing your nakedness. Or maybe it's a split that gives a peak of the thigh. Or maybe it's the hole in the jeans that's pretty good size, and we can see part of your nakedness. When the thigh is exposed, your nakedness is exposed. Here's another principle, divinely made clothing. Nakedness is not to be seen. Here's something we don't talk a lot about when we talk about modesty, and I bid you listen very carefully. That men are more visually stimulated than women. There are exceptions to that, but men are more visually stimulated than men. Compared to women, men are more easily aroused by visual stimuli. That's why porn is a greater temptation for men than women. There are a number of women who've been caught up in porn, but far greater numbers of men. Doesn't justify that, but it simply says that's why men sometimes get caught in that. It's because they're more visually stimulated than women. And isn't it interesting that Jesus said that a man who looks upon a woman to lust after he's committed adultery already in his heart? Was well, it wrong for a woman to lust at a man and, and, and have adultery? Yes, that's wrong for the woman. But why did he mention the man? Because men are more prone to that than women. And you notice the same thing in Proverbs chapter 6 and in verse 25. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Remember the three chapters, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. In the middle chapter, we've looked at 5 and 7. Now chapter 6, do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Men are more prone to be stimulated by the visual than for the women. Not only are they more prone to be stimulated by the visual, they're prone to be stimulated more quickly. One brother says, comparing the man with the woman, that one is more like the crockpot and the other is like a microwave. And I think that well describes that. We're trying to speak plainly, and we're trying to speak bluntly. Ladies, listen to this. It doesn't take much visually to arouse a man's sexual interest in you. Even a hint, a glimpse, or a peek will do that. Now, it is true the Bible talks in 2 Peter 2 and in verse 14 about men who have eyes full of adultery. That's men who have dirty minds. You cannot look at anyone, any woman, and not think of adulterous things and think of sexual matters, no matter how well-dressed she may be. That is true. There are men with, with dirty minds. But I want to suggest to you that's not the man that we're concerned about in our study tonight. And that's not the man that we're going to be talking about. Not all men have dirty minds. Not all men have eyes full of adultery, and yet they could be easily tempted by what they see. I want to suggest to you that there are good, godly men who try their best to be pure and who, when they see a sexually attractive dress, they have to fight sexual thoughts. Pay attention to that, ladies. Mothers and fathers, pay attention to that. that there are good, godly men who have to fight the thoughts of what they see when they are not wanting to see the things that are put before them. For a woman to dress in a way that is sexually attractive and then put all the blame on the man for his thoughts is like leaving bare wires exposed and you blame the child for being electrocuted. He shouldn't have touched the wires. But you left it exposed for him. And you bear responsibility for that child. And you'll bear some responsibility if you expose yourself to create those thoughts. Now let's talk about another Bible principle. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
I want to analyze some words that are found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Let's start with the word modest. In like manner also, women should adorn themselves in, and here's our word, modest peril. Let's define the word modest. That's one we use more frequently. The English dictionary defines that as showing a moderate estimation of one's talents, abilities, or value, having a shy, retiring nature reserved, observing the conventional propriety in speech and behavior and dress, quiet and reserved, humble, unpretentious, a modest house, for example, or a modest charge, not extreme. We don't always use that with reference to dress. We may use that with reference to describing someone's house. They live in a modest house, or a restaurant may charge for their food. They have a modest price. It means there's a sense of reservation. But let's go a little bit further. The Bible says that words means orderly or well arranged or decent. The well ordering not of dress and demeanor only, but of inner life, uttering indeed, expressing itself in outward conversation. It is that inner sense of well ordered life so that there is a sense of reservation. That's the idea. Strong says it means orderly or decorous, of good behavior, used of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 2. It comes from the word from which we get our word world, cosmos, well-ordered, well-arranged. Thayer says it means well-arranged. Bauer says it means respectable, honorable, modest, Kubo says, respectable. So let's give a summary of what we just saw. What does the word modest suggest? When you talk about my attire needs to be modest, it means there needs to be a sense of reservation. Would, would you describe someone who is exposing their nakedness and say, you know what, he or she is really reserved. I, they're just so reserved, and they stand there exposing their nakedness. I wouldn't use that word to describe that, would you? It means they're respectable, they're decent, they're orderly. But there are other words in our text we want to consider. Let's go back to the same text in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at this word shame. 1 Timothy 2, and in verse 9, the third address in modest power was shamefastness or shamefacedness, the King James says. Well, here's some, how that, uh, here's some other ways in which that's translated, shamefastness, or the New King James says shamefacedness, or the New King James says propriety, the American Standard says shamefacedness. It is the idea of a sense of shame. It comes from a word that means this, it's a sense of shame or modesty, Vine says. Shamefastness is that modesty which is, here's where we get the concept of fast, that is fast or rooted in our character. It's not a, a pretense of shame where you put on a front or a veneer, but it is fast rooted in your character so that you do not want to display yourself before others because of that modest spirit that you have. Strong says it comes from a compound word which gives the idea of bashfulness or downcast eyes. Can you imagine someone as you're changing clothes and you're in your undergarments and someone barges in on you? Are you going to stand there boldly and just look them in the eye? Or are you going to have downcast eyes a little embarrassed by that? And that concept is what's talked about here. There's a sense of shame where I don't want to expose myself before others. I'm trying to hide my nakedness. But there's another term that has to do with good judgment in our text, and that's this word sobriety. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9, the modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, the King James says. What does this word mean? It means good judgment. King James uses the word sobriety. New King James uses the word moderation. What's that word mean? Well, it means, according to Vine, the soundness of mind. Sound judgment, that practically expresses the meaning. It's that habitual inner self-government, which that constant reign on all the passions and desires which would hinder the temptation of these from arising. I like this definition from Strong, soundness of mind, sanity. We need to use good judgment, moderation. Good judgment says, you don't show what he shouldn't see. Don't put all the blame on him saying he shouldn't be looking, but don't show him what he shouldn't be seeing. That's good judgment, isn't it? Well, let's go a little bit further. I want to secondly talk about this principle. We've looked at simple principles for dress, but I want to move secondly to this aspect of our study, and that is I want us to consider that it is altogether possible that your clothes could be sexually attractive. Hopefully you're still with me at this point and you followed carefully and you say, well, you know, I agree with you that our clothes should not be sexually attractive, but I don't dress that way. Well, hopefully that's the case. 
But I want us to consider that it's altogether possible our clothes could be sexually attractive. Let's clarify what we mean by sexually attractive dress. I've carefully worded that. Let's talk about the word attract. What does the word attract mean? It comes from a Latin compound word which means add in the direction of and trahere means to pull. To attract means to pull in the direction of. And that's where we get our word tractor or traction. If you have a tractor or a tractor trailer, you pass on the road, here's the tractor pulling the load in its direction. And that very concept is what we're talking about here. It means to draw or to pull toward. The word attractive simply means providing pleasure, arousing interest, having the ability to draw or to pull. So when we talk about sexually attractive clothing, it is that clothing that draws or pulls attention toward one's body. It is that clothing that draws sexual attention to one's body. It is that clothing that draws attention to sections of the body that are sexually arousing. And we'll talk more about the details of that here in just a moment. But I want us to go a step further now. I want us to notice that our clothing sends a signal that at times could very well be sexual. And we may have no clue that we're sending that signal. Get that point for a moment. Our clothing could send a signal that at times are sexual whether we realize that or not, whether we intend that to be the case or not. As for the men, as far as they're concerned, sexually attractive clothing has the same effect whether or not that is your intent. You may be sending signals that you're not aware that you're sending. Let me give you an illustration of that. Let's suppose a man walks out of his house one, one day in the middle of the day on a Saturday and he looks to the neighbor on the right side and he looks over there and he sees this woman is out working in her yard in her bikini. Her intent and her motive is she's trying to be attractive. She's trying to draw sexual attention to herself. So he looks to the other side on the left side of the house and he looks over there and there's a woman in a bikini and she's not trying to be sexually attractive. She doesn't want anybody to see her, she thinks, but she happens to be out there anyway. As far as the man who sees that, it has the same impact no matter what their intent was. You understand that? No matter what the intent was, it has the same impact. I want you to bear with me on some quotations from this work called The Male Factor. You can't read probably this at the bottom, that this is an excerpt taken from The Male Factors and Unwritten Rules and mis Misinterpretations and Secret of Beliefs of Men in the Workplace by Shante Feldhahn. This is not a New Testament Christian. This is not a gospel preacher. This is a woman writing about men in the workplace, and or rather women in the workplace, who are oblivious to the impact their clothing has. It says a great deal to us. Bear with the quotations. She said, among thousands of men and women I have interviewed and surveyed over the years, I've found no subject more universally misunderstood than what a man thinks when he sees a woman overtly showing a good figure. We are frequently told men are visual, but I've realized that many women don't know what that actually means. According to brain psychologists and researchers such as Michael Guron, some percent of women, perhaps as high as 25 percent, are visual in a similar way to men that we talked about just a minute ago. But if you're in that category, you're more likely to instinctively understand men's reaction. But the other 75% who aren't that visual have very little concept, literally, of how men see them. In 2001, when I was interviewing for uh, a few trusted male friends for a novel, and I won't read all of this quotation, but I'll summarize what she just said. She said, I was trying to work on this novel, and I had a, a scene in my novel where a woman was giving a business presentation and she had on a tight form-fitting dress. It was a little bit short and revealing. And I asked men, what would be the men in the crowd? What would they be thinking as they're watching her give the presentation? And here was what her co-worker said. Well, if you're going to write this in a novel, these men would be thinking this. Great body. Stop it. I need to, and I, what am I thinking? I bet she's using those curves to sell the deal. Look at her face. Look at her face. I wonder what's under that nice suit. And so she says, I was surprised that these men, who seem to be happily married men, were respectful of women, were saying that about this character I was trying to portray. She goes further. 
And in most instances, the women had no idea what that was going on in the side of the men around them. The visual wiring men have presents a, a similar temptation that men often say they don't want or wish that they could turn off, especially in a business setting. Their visual nature is highly attuned to and predisposed to take in appealing images, including images of appealing women. And if that woman is dressing in a way that emphasizes her assets, the fact is, not only noticed, but often begins to train a thought that men in business would not rather have. But their more visual nature isn't something they can easily turn off. They must work to ignore it. In talking to men, I found the most incredibly puzzled, uh, uh, I found most incredibly puzzled as to why women wouldn't want to avoid the situation. Why men, men uh, were wondering why a professional woman dressing that way would like to cause men to distract and miss some of what she's saying. Let me go a little bit further. She talks about the male and female disconnect. She said to test the difference in men and women's perception in this area, I asked men what they would think if they saw a woman dressing in a way that emphasized and showed off her figure in some way, such as a low-cut top and a tight skirt. And I asked white-collared uh, white women who said that sometimes they dressed that way and when what was actually going through their minds, and here's the starkly differing results. 76% of the men felt that women wanted the, the woman, wanted the men, to look at her body, yet only 23% of the women actually felt that way. In other words, three out of four women said that's not what they were thinking at all. They were dressing in a sexually attractive way, and they said, we weren't thinking that we were being sexually attractive. Among those who were female colleagues who didn't have a strict workplace uniform, 58% said they see a female associate dressing in a way that is distracting at least once a week. 12% said that they see examples every day, multiple times a day. And most of the men in question undoubtedly, women who dress that way undoubtedly dress professionally and attractive, not to be, are not aware of the, their attire is perceived as visually distracting. Well, there's more to that quotation, but I'm just sharing with you, here is somebody from the world who says that men are visually stimulated by what they see. And that's the point we made. Our clothing sends a signal. Here's one of the most interesting things that can be said about clothing as a testimony to the effect it has, and here's the testimony from a prostitute. The attire of a harlot. Let's go back to that passage, at least in our minds, if not turning there for a moment. The Bible talks about how she came and she was dressed in the attire of a harlot. That says a lot, doesn't it? The attire of a harlot. It says that she knows how to be sexually attractive is what that says. The woman who is dressed this way is not necessarily a trashy, painted-up gal who walks the streets. But it's one who knows the clothing that she wears pulls or draws sexual attention to herself. I want to give you some information from a fellow gospel preacher, Gary Henry. Many of you may know him and heard him in meetings. Brother Henry, several years ago, had an opportunity to interview a prostitute. He emphasizes that she was off-duty at the time. But she happened to sit in a bus seat beside him as they were in Nevada, where prostitution is legal, by the way. And so as she rode along beside him, they began to ask each other, what, what, what kind of work do you do? And she mentioned that she worked weekends at a brothel on commission. So she has to sell herself, doesn't she? And Gary asked her, are you familiar with that statement in the Bible that talks about the attire of a harlot? She says, yes, I am. And he said, could you explain that to me? And here's what she said. She said the attire of a harlot is how she draws attention to certain parts of her body. This is not an old fogey grandmother, not an out-of-date preacher. This is a prostitute who knows her business. And she said, here's how it's done. There's five ways you do that. I want to quickly listen, and I want to come back and describe them in a minute. But she said, first of all, you reveal it. That's the least effective way. A second way you do that is you conceal it and reveal everything else, like a bikini. There's another way you could do that. You reveal just a little bit of it. You give a hint, a preview, or a glimpse. And a fourth way you do this is you cover your body tightly so that you show the form of your body, and the most provocative of all is cover it thinly. She said, that's the attire of the harlot. She would say, I know, because that's my business. Well, Gary began to ask her more questions. He said, you know a good bit about men, it seems like. And her response was, well, it's my business to know. 
And Gary said, well, why is it that religious women often don't know as much about men as you seem to know about how men operate? And listen to this carefully, mothers and fathers. Because they have never been taught about, a man, by, about men by anyone other than their mothers who often know very little themselves. Women who know how a man thinks are those who've been taught by a man. I was taught by a man, she said. That's how I know. So let's go back over those. Here's the way she says that you have or dress like a harlot. First of all, you reveal it. It's the idea of showing more skin. The idea may be the more you show, the more attractive you become. You give them a look at your thighs. You show it to them. You reveal it to them. You give them a look at your breast or maybe a part of that. Or maybe you let them see your midriff. Or you show your back and your shoulders. You're revealing what you can so that you become sexually attractive. That's one of the ways. The prostitute said so. But here was the second way she said you do that. You can see it and reveal everything else. The swimsuit, especially the bikini would do that, that draws attention to what remains covered. She said that's not the most effective way, but that's one of the ways of dressing like a harlot. The third way she said was reveal just a little bit of it, where you give them a glimpse of your thigh. You don't show them the whole thigh. That would be wrong to do for the Christian woman, she would think. But she'll show them part of it. Give them a glimpse of the thigh. The dress or the skirt may not be real short, but it just gives a hint of the thigh. Gives a little bit of interest there. Or maybe it's jeans that play peekaboo with a low back. So they see more than you perhaps want to show. Maybe it's cleavage that shows a preview of the breast. Where you're revealing just a little bit of it. The third or fourth method, she said, was you cover it tightly, like the one piece bathing suits, or maybe like the tight jeans or the pants, or maybe like the tops that reveal the shape of the body, or maybe it's the snug fit of the dress or the skirt over the backside, or maybe it's the lines of the undergarment are clearly marked out where you're covering it tightly. The prostitute says that's an effective way of drawing sexual attention to yourself. The fifth was you cover it thinly. She said this is the most provocative of all, perhaps the wider thin tops that reveal the undergarments. Or maybe it's the thin pants where you can see the undergarments as well. Or maybe the material is so thin that it clings closely to the body. The prostitute says that's a very effective way. I'm still developing this thought that it's very possible our clothing could, could be sexually attractive. But I want to move to another point. I want to suggest to you that revealing clothing can be more sexually attractive than complete nudity. Let me give you one quotation that will give us some insight to that. This has been quoted since the 1960s. Theodore Reich of Love and Lust said, an astonishing great number of men are of the opinion that women are more attractive partly dressed than nude. They prefer to see women partially disrobed to the side of complete nakedness. In many cases, development of sexual excitement is retarded or weakened by the nude body while the sight of a partially unclothed female body affects these men as exciting. You stop and think about that. You wouldn't think of your daughters or your children or you yourself going out in public completely nude because that would be wrong, but partially clothed would be all right, and yet that may be more sexually attractive according to this account. Now, last of all, I want to share with you in the few minutes we have remained a few objections that people make. That is, after hearing a lesson like this, here are some of the objections that I commonly hear. You may hear some very similar or others that I'd be glad to entertain if I have opportunity, but here are some of the objections that are made. Someone to be sure to say that if someone thinks something, then that's their problem. I'm going to dress this way, and if a man looks at me and he has lust or he has some kind of sexual thoughts, that's his problem. It's not mine. Well, their problem is secondary to the thing that we're trying to address. The main problem we're talking about tonight is that parts of your body, including your thigh and your form and your cleavage, should not be shown to any man except your mate. That's what we're talking about. That whether he thinks anything or not, you have no right to be showing that to someone else, is the point. One who causes another to stumble or initiates the process bears some guilt. Let's look at a couple of passages. Start with Luke chapter 17. Do I bear some guilt if I do something to cause somebody to sin? 
Well, the Bible tells us so. Look at Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, if you will. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It were better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and thrown into the depths of the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. You call someone else to sin? Yes, they, they are stumbling and they did wrong. But you bear some responsibility to that, Luke 17 says. And by the way, do you remember Jezebel who stirred his, her husband up? 1 Kings 22, 21 and verse 25. She may not have been sinning herself, the committing the overdose, but she stirred him up to do that. And we can stir people to do that as well. Here's another objection that's made. This one is commonly made. You can't know where to draw the line. I understand we need to be modest, but... How do you know where to draw the line? There is nowhere to draw the line. And the Bible doesn't tell us where to draw a line. And you think about that for a moment. It's certain that there are areas of judgment when it comes to modesty. But if you say that you can't draw the line, that puts us in a real strange position, doesn't it? If you're going to take the position and you say, well, there, there, we cannot know where to draw the line, well, then let's play with that just a little bit. Then that's going to let the length of the, the dress get shorter, then shorter, and then shorter, and then shorter. And you tell me when to draw the line. Since we can't know to draw the line before we're through, we've taken the skirt completely off, haven't we? If not, why not? And if we don't know where to draw the line, let's take the top and let it get lower and lower and lower, and you tell me when to stop and you tell me where we draw the line, and if we don't know where to draw the line and we can't know, then we've taken the top completely off, haven't we? If not, why not? If not, why not? And if you draw a line, it will be according to your concept, if that's the argument you're making, an arbitrary line. And so let's take in your mind the woman's skirt and you let's take it two inches above the knee and three and then four and you tell me when to stop five and then six and then seven and eight and then ten and then twelve and then, well, we don't have much more to go, do we? Wherever you say, well, that's too far, stop right there, that's far enough. You drew an arbitrary line. I'm not trying to draw an arbitrary line. I'm trying to draw a biblical line. And the same thing with the top coming down. That's kind of... Uh, interesting argument that people made in objection. We can draw a line. You say, well, how do you know? God put the garment on the man and the woman and God clothed them from the shoulder to the knee by definition of what a tunic is. God drew a line. I like divinely made clothing. I think God did better than the designers of the day. I can draw a line that when the thigh is exposed, that is nakedness, by biblical definition, Exodus 28 in verse 42. When clothing becomes sexually attractive, it's time to draw the line. You say, well, I don't, we can't figure out how tight tight is. Well, then let's just stretch it as tight as you can over the body. Is that okay? Is that all right? And when you begin to say, you tell me when it gets too tight as we start stretching it over the body, then when you say, well, wait a minute, that's too far, we've got to stop, then you just drew an arbitrary line again, didn't you? When it becomes sexually attractive, that's where we have to draw the line. Here's another contention that's made and last. Quite often when I present this material at home or something similar to it, somebody will say, well, you know, you're right about what you said, but it's really hard to find modest clothing. And those who say that are those who are dressing immodest. It's just really hard to find modest clothing. Well, it's hard, but it's not impossible. If you can't find modest clothing, then what we're saying is we cannot conform to God's word is what we can't do. Are, are, are we going to say that God tells me to be modest and I can't conform to that? There's no way. I just can't do what you told us to do, God, because there's not modest clothing around. That's absurd. That is absolutely absurd. The way of the Lord may be hard at times. It's difficult and it's, and it's narrow. And it may be confining. It may be hard to do what the Lord told us to do, but it is not impossible to do. Let me illustrate that for a moment. Let's just suppose for a moment. And I know we're supposing, but let me illustrate, and you'll see the point I'm making. Let's suppose, in order to be identified with God's people, that the book of God requires us to wear orange coveralls. And you say, well, those are ugly. That's not the question. You say, well, that's not in style. 
That's not the question, is it? But let's just suppose for an illustration that I could show you from the New Testament that God requires us to dress in some kind of garment that we may call them coveralls today, may have been called something else in the New Testament, but that's what you had to wear in order to be identified with God's people. Let's just suppose that. The question is, what would you do? What would you do? Would you say, that's hard to find orange coveralls unless you go to prison? Is that what you'd say? And so then would you just wear whatever you wanted to wear because it's hard to find orange coveralls? Would you rather just look like the world and be identified with the world than be identified with God's people? Because all of God's people wear orange coveralls in our illustration. What would you do? Would it be worth the sacrifice and all the ridicule that when you go around the town and you go to school and you're wearing orange coveralls that people kind of wonder, why in the world you dress like that? Why are you different from everybody else? We're all wearing all colorful clothes, but you wear orange coveralls all the time. Would it be worth the sacrifice to be identified with God's people? And when you find it hard to make them, would you make sure you had some orange coveralls and make sure yours were orange? I think I could think of several ways. I'm not a seamstress, but I believe I could figure out, I might buy some white coveralls and dye them orange, couldn't I? Wouldn't that be a choice? And if that was the choice, could I might, if that's the only thing I could do, could I not maybe find a seamstress somewhere that could make me some orange coveralls? I can't find them anywhere in my size. So could I get somebody to make me some? I bet we could find somebody that'd make us all a pair of orange coveralls. So if that's the question, it's hard to find decent clothing. You may not find what you want at the price you want, but there are people that'll make you clothing that'll fit you so that you conform to God's will. That can be done. That absolutely can be done. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in verse 14 to 17 that we're not to be protectors of the world. Verse 14, we're not to be unequally yoked together with the unbelievers. Don't pull together in the same load of sin. Don't do what they do. Verse 17, come out from among them and be ye separate. You may feel at times you're wearing orange coveralls by the modest clothing you wear, but so be it. If it identifies you with the people of God rather than the world, then so be it. Let us conform our lives to the book of God. What have we seen in our study tonight? Well, we've seen simple principles that define our clothing. We've talked about it's possible our clothing could be sexually attractive, and we've looked at some objections that are, are being made. Let me close with this question. Could you say that one is trying to not be sexually attractive when if an additional inch of skin were exposed, that it would show their nakedness. My point is, when, when we try to get as close to the line as we can, rather than trying to, I want to be modest, I want to make sure I'm modest. Could you actually say this person is trying not to be sexually attractive when they get that close, where if they just showed another half inch of skin, they would be showing their nakedness? Could you say they're trying not to be sexually attractive if, they're standing okay, they're standing up, they're fine, but if they were to bend or to stoop or to sit, they're showing their nakedness now. Could you actually say they're trying not to be sexually attractive? And could you say that if the clothing was just a half inch tighter that they would clearly mark out their form or they, they're getting that close, that just a little more and they're marking out their form so that they become sexually attractive? Well, I ask you to give it a fair hearing. I hope you have. And I hope that'll help you to think about some things we need to talk about from time to time. It's not a pleasant study to, to give. It's not a pleasant study to hear. But we need that among the people of God. The people at home have asked me to preach that lesson every year. And when the next year rolls around, they say, ask, bring that same lesson again. We want to hear that same thing again for our children. And we need to hear that. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? Maybe there's an erring child of God who needs to make correction. If you're subject, would you come? All together we stand and while we sing.